Let's start by talking about some basic concepts that define simple harmonic motion. So the first thing we'll do is let's talk about the couple of different types of simple harmonic oscillators that we're going to focus on in this class. So the first one is an object that bounces back and forth. And our clearest example of this is a spring and mass system. So notice what we have here is we've got a line that's telling us what the equilibrium position is for our system. So the equilibrium position defines where this spring and mass system wants to be if you let it come to rest. But notice what we've done is we've pulled it away from equilibrium. And in doing that, there happens to be a restoring force that's now acting on the spring and mass system that's trying to return it to equilibrium. So in pulling my mass over to the right, there's now a force that's pulling the mass back to the left, trying to get it back to equilibrium. And as it bounces back and forth, that mass is going to continue to act to continue to try and bring my system to equilibrium. So that's the first type of simple harmonic oscillator, one that bounces back and forth. The other type that we'll talk about is one that swings back and forth. And so again, our, our easiest example of that is a simple pendulum. So a simple pendulum is basically, I, I simply have a mass that sits at the end of a massless string. And again, there is an equilibrium position. Right? It wants to hang straight down. But what I've done is I've pulled it away and then let it go. And so now it swings back and forth. And instead of bouncing back and forth at a line, it swings back and forth through some angle. And of course, it does this because there's a restoring torque that tries to return the system to equilibrium. So these are the two types of simple harmonic oscillators that we'll deal with. The first one that bounces back and forth we'll call a linear simple harmonic oscillator. Again, it's, it's oscillating along a line. The second one we'll call an angular simple harmonic oscillator. So again, it's the angle that it's rotating through that we're going to care about. Now, for all of these simple harmonic oscillators, they're going to exhibit sinusoidal motion, which means that they're, the motion that they're going to go through can be described by some sort of sine or cosine curve. And so here's what a plot of that looks like. So what I have on my, on my vertical axis here is the displacement. So this could be either the linear displacement for my spring and mass system or, an ang or the angular displacement. For my simple pendulum, it doesn't matter. But what I'm plotting on this axis is the displacement. So how far away from equilibrium is my system displaced? And notice that can be in the positive direction or it can be in the negative direction. The center line here, the center axis, that's the equilibrium point. And so what you see is, whether it's bouncing or swinging, it's oscillating about that equilibrium point. Well, there are a couple important parameters that I can pull out of this graph. The first one is the amplitude. And the amplitude is simply a measure of what's the maximum displacement that my simple harmonic oscillator reaches. Uh, in this case, it's simply what's the distance from right, my center line representing equilibrium and the peak of my curve. The other parameter that I'll care about is one that cares about what's going on horizontally. So the amplitude is a measure of what's going on vertically. The period is a measure of what's going on horizontally. So the horizontal axis here is time. So the period is simply a chunk of time. It happens to be the chunk of time that it takes for my system to go through one complete cycle. So notice that I can get that either from going from peak point of my curve to the next peak point of my curve. This time chunk corresponds to one period, right? What's the, what's the time it takes for my system to go through a full cycle? I could also read that by going from negative amplitude to negative amplitude. Again, that's also going to give me what the period is. I can also get the period by thinking about what's going on at equilibrium. It's just that I don't go from equilibrium point to equilibrium point because I need to be traveling in the same direction. So here's a situation where initially, at this, point in, at this point right here on my graph, I have a negative slope. So my, the velocity of my object happens to be in the negative direction. 
As it comes back through equilibrium here, I've got a positive slope, which tells me it's traveling in the positive direction. That's only halfway through the, halfway through the cycle. I need to wait until now it comes all the way back through and is traveling in the same direction. To complete the period, I have to get back to equilibrium traveling in the same way that I was initially. And so this is a third way that I can measure what the period is. Now, because we know we have sinusoidal motion, that means we have motion that's described by some sort of sinusoidal function. So we could, we could choose a sine curve, we could choose a cosine, a cosine curve, we could choose a linear combination of those. What we're actually going to choose to use is a cosine curve. And so you'll notice that for my linear simple harmonic oscillator, so this is my spring and mass system that bounces back and forth or something that acts like that, I have a displacement from equilibrium as a function of time that's going to be given by the following expression. So A here is the amplitude, and in this case that happens to simply be what's the maximum displacement. So here it's a, A is a, um, what's the maximum linear displacement from amplitude. I'm choosing to use a cosine curve, and then what I plug into the cosine curve is called its phase. And there are three pieces that I'm going to care about in terms of building the phase. So the first one is the angular frequency. So we've seen omega before. It still has the same units here. It's still radians per second, but now it's not an angular speed. It's what's known as the angular frequency. I'm going to take that angular frequency with units of radians per second, multiply it by time, which has units of seconds. And so this product, omega t, has units of radians. So what I'm plugging into my phase has to be in radians here. The phase shift, this last piece that, that gets plugged into the phase, again, it also has units of radians. What it's telling me is how much I've shifted my cosine curve left or right because I didn't start my clock when I let my object go. So for a cosine, cosine should be at its maximum when t equals zero. And so if you have a curve that sure enough is at its maximum value at t equals zero, then you don't have a phase shift, phi is zero. On the other hand, if what you have is it at t equals zero, your curve isn't at its maximum, then you have some phase shift that's simply telling you how much you've moved the curve left or right from a true cosine curve that's at its maximum at t equals zero. So this is for a linear simple harmonic oscillator. Bounces back and forth. Of course, it's the same basic equation for an angular simple harmonic oscillator. So if I have something that swings back and forth, well now I'm not interested in a linear displacement, I'm interested in an angular displacement. So here I've got theta that's measuring the angular displacement from equilibrium. Again, it's given as a function of time. It's equal to, well A here is still the amplitude, it's just my amplitude is now an angle. So what's the maximum angle that my system ever becomes displaced from equilibrium as it swings back and forth. And then I'm going to multiply A times cosine again, and notice it's the same thing inside the, inside the phase. So it's still the angular frequency times time plus the phase shift. So it doesn't matter which type of simple harmonic oscillator I'm using, both of them are, are basically described by the same equation. Now, there are three key parameters that we're really going to think about in talking about simple harmonic motion. The first one we've already seen graphically, it's, it's the period. And so the period is the time it takes to complete one cycle. It's a time, it has units of seconds just like any chunk of time in SI units. And so the period simply says how long does it take for your system to go through one full cycle. Well, the second thing I can relate that to is the frequency. And so the frequency is a measure of the number of cycles my system will go through per second. So notice that the frequency has units of one over second. We tend to use hertz as the SI units for frequency. So hertz, again, is just another way of saying one over seconds, inverse seconds. Both of these, both period and frequency, are related to the angular frequency. And so the angular frequency, again, is a measure of the rate at which the phase is changing inside that cosine function. 
it has units of radians per second, which is why when we multiply it by time, omega t has units of radians, which is what we're plugging into the cosine curve. Now, all three of these things relate to each other. There's basically one set of equations. We can just rearrange it for whichever one of these three things we want. So here, I've got, I've got it set up so that I can calculate the period because that's either one over the frequency or it's two pi over the angular frequency. If instead I want to know the frequency, well, that's one over the period or the angular frequency divided by two pi. And then the last version, of course, is, well, if what I want is the angular frequency, that's two pi over the period or two pi times the frequency. And so these period frequency, angular frequency, these are going to define the motion in terms of what's going on with our simple harmonic oscillator. And so we want to make sure that we can relate these three quantities to each other as we go through working problems with the simple harmonic motion.